I'm Cynthia Murphy. And I am Georgia Bowers. And this is Delete My Browser History. So um, I'm going to be talking a bit again about something that inspired part of Last One to Die, which I talked about last week. Um, so Last One to Die was my first novel. And even though it's contemporary, it's set now, the, the main kind of themes behind it are all very Victorian and the Victorians did some weird and wonderful stuff. Um, so today I'm going to tell you about Victorian death and mourning rituals. Ooh. So um, again, Wikipedia, I've also looked at the Spruce, which weirdly enough is a crafting website. <laughs> oh. um, Atlas Obscura and a Welcome Blog. So the Welcome Collection in London. So uh, Victorian death and mourning rituals, I'm going to talk about jewellery first. So jewellery was used as a way of remembering a loved one who had passed away since the medieval period. It's also known as memento mori, which essentially means remember you will die. Um, I think people, nice. I, know, I know it seems really weird to us, but I think people dealt with death so much more. Oh, completely. Back then, yeah. like illnesses yeah. and, you know, people didn't survive as long. And so I think people were more used to death and more prepared for it, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Like they knew yeah. it was going to come and, you know, they, what they could do was remember a person who passed on. Mm. Um, so kind of wealthier people tended to do it with jewellery. It's interesting as well, because um, mourning jewellery, especially love locks, which are locks of a loved one's hair that would be braided or used in jewellery. They were sometimes worn as bracelets or kept in lockets. Um, these are often cited in spells and charms of the time. So love spells, ah. uh, love charms. If you had a lock of somebody's hair, then your spell would be more successful. And it was also used as a token of affection. So it didn't have to be that somebody had passed away. If you were engaged or you were betrothed to somebody, you might give a lock of your hair or you might do it. Um, so if somebody's traveling, they can kind of take a part of you with them. Hair was really popular. Um, and it's mainly because it doesn't decay for a long time. So... Yeah. It said hundreds, maybe thousands of years hair can last for. Um, and we all know the stories about like someone's hair will keep growing after they've died, which I don't think is actually true. I think it's that everything else shrinks. Yeah. yeah. So the hair looks like it's grown. Um, so hair was really, really popular. It all started with Queen Victoria when she lost her husband. She started like kickstarted the Victorian mourning trend. So when she was wearing black, and she was wearing black jewellery and she had some hair work embroidery made, then it kind of, it started a trend. Hair was also popular because wig makers were out of work because the trend for wigs from the 17th and 18th centuries. Oh, I had see. So people who were doing that were moving into different types oh. of hair work because... That, yeah, they were all over it because they're yeah. like... Isn't that yeah, fascinating? I to, thought that was yeah. just don't yeah, think adapt. about it. Yeah. Um, it was definitely an upper class thing at first. So goldsmiths would make really beautiful pieces. They'd use precious metals. They would use pearls. Um, they would use jet. And it was expensive. So when the trend kind of filtered down, it's like the celebrity trend of like the 1800s, when it filtered down to the normal working and middle class um they either wanted to save money or they didn't quite trust the people who were making the jewelry so there was um stories about where the jewelers making them had used somebody else's hair or they'd lost the hair oh. that had been, so it wasn't actually made with your loved mm. one's hair which was the whole point of it so there were mid-Victorian instructional guides on how to make your own hair jewellery and it became really uh, popular, I know, with the lower classes. Can I just um, say that my lights just flashed. Oh, really? Yes. 
Anyway, continue. Um, oh, you've lost me now. Sorry. It's all right. Uh, yes, yeah, so that was so weird. It became even more popular in America than it did in the UK because, of course, the Civil War was going on. So, again, mm. loads of death, lots of people, you know, going away and fighting. Um, yeah. It's it ties in with that whole spiritualism thing of people trying to contact the dead and they always seem to mm. come about at times of war. And it's strange because I feel like recently in the last couple of years, a lot of people have been rediscovering their spirituality and crystals and things. And I do wonder if it's like a pandemic thing that people are kind of faced with their own mortality. Yeah. So they look for kind of explanations elsewhere. So, um, so aside from seances and stuff, hair work became a really popular hobby and in the civil war they would make wreaths so there are pictures online of actual like garlands of hair um and you would get patterns in some popular magazines that give you a little starter start kit on how to make (laughs) on how to make a hair wreath and presumably you'd, because that would take a lot of hair, wouldn't it? Yeah, and it not makes just hair. Up. There's they would use wire. They would they're really ornate. I'll talk a little mm. bit more about them in a minute, but yeah, it seems completely bizarre. So there wasn't just hair yeah. jewelry. There was also um, black jewelry was really popular for mourning. It wasn't always for mourning though, and there was an English publication called the Queen in 1870 which said jet jewellery was much in vogue and used for social wear and it was also a popular tourist souvenir in Whitby because I didn't know it was a thing but Whitby is famous for its jet so jet um the black stone was mined in Whitby and then it was sold as tourist attractions now yeah um or souvenirs even and In this magazine, it also suggests that if you don't want to buy the tourist stuff or you can't afford the the really good stuff, you can get French jets, which is actually really dark red, not black. Oh, there you go. So always thrifty. So you can also identify it through its symbolism. Um, So the Spruce, which is a crafting website, had this on it, which I found really interesting. So it just tells a little bit about the Victorian symbolism of life and death. So you might have a spray of oak leaves or an empty acorn cup, and that would signify a life cycle. Um, Lily of the Valley was often on there, and that was that represented reuniting loved ones together. Oh. You could have forget-me-nots or weeping willows, which seem kind of obvious, the weeping willow. Mm. It looks like it's sad forget-me-nots you know does what it says on the tin um there's actually one it's in the welcome collection in London and I've been in to see it and it's a brooch and it's got the most beautiful weeping willow on it and it's only when you study it you realize that entire weeping willow is made out of hair wow yeah, it's so intricate it's it's just bizarre um crosses and funeral urns anchors which represented hope and um they became a trend for matte black jewellery and it was referred to as dead black, which I think is really funny. <laughs> um, dead black. Sounds so mank. And they would use seed pearls, so little tiny baby pearls. They would use them to represent tears. On the oh, wow. So some examples, um, Atlas Obscura had some good examples. There's one image um, I've written of OTT, So it's this American nosegay from 1860-61. And it actually says on it, it's by Mrs. William J. Smith. And it's this really intricate floral arrangement, all different types of flowers. And it's in like a cornucopia, you know, a horn-shaped basket. And they're all overflowing. And that's all made with wire and hair. Wow. And the Welcome Collection that I mentioned in London, they've got morning brooches. So they've got a few of them. They've got one little crisscrossed hair one. I know they've got some other memento mori, like little skull ring and stuff like that. Um, And in 
1867, going back to the books, a guy called Mark Campbell published a 276 page book called Self-Instruction in the Art of Hair Work, Dressing Hair, Making Curls, Switches, Braids and Hair Jewellery of Every Description. And in that <laughs> book, so this links in with Mrs. Smith's um, nosegay, they would show you how to make different types of things. So not just morning jewellery. Some people used their relatives' hair to make family trees oh. that they would gift to each other. <laughs> oh, no. I don't know. Imagine like getting a Christmas present and opening it up and it just being like all your relatives' hair. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's just... Um, and they would do it as friendship keepsakes. So they would like gift things to one another. Um, and there'd be different imagery in all of them. Some of them are incredibly beautiful. They're just so lovely. And until you realize what it's made out of. Yeah. You know, yeah. they give you the kind of ick. The popularity diminished just before World War One. So you think people didn't have time. You know, men were fighting, women were taking on traditionally male roles they had less time for crafting things so these hobbies kind of died out and everybody got a a much more straightforward view of life and death you know rather than this kind of romanticized victorian one yeah so found on the welcome blog um it's from eddie's portfolio on the welcome blog the question was posed well why is it weird why is hair so weird you know there's other things that you could make we use leather mm. you know but why is hair weird so anthropologist mary douglas has proposed that any matter that is out of place including hair poses a threat of chaos and disorder as it is now dirt so she said that in 1966 so you can imagine especially from a dead body that hair it's removed yeah. from where it should be and I mean you find a hair on something even in your own house and you know you find a hair in your own dinner like, oh, that you yeah. know is 99% yours and it you know it puts some people off so much yeah. they can't eat the rest of the food we subconsciously associate it with death disease and decay our survival instinct kind of kicks in um and it's it's that feeling that being near the dead thing could make you a dead thing as well so it's a survival instinct it's our subconscious mm. conspiring to protect us from death mm. so there you go so uh i've got fun fact i've got fun facts actually and then i've only written one <laughs> samuel peeps the guy who was famous from his fire of london um diaries had 129 memento mori rings and he organised them into three different grades of quality when he had them on display. Why did he have them? He co like collected them. Did he collect them? Mm -hmm. So, and he, yeah. I don't he know how he organised. I don't know what quality, whether it means how good the hair work was or <laughs> whether it's like the quality of the jewels or, yeah. you know, that's a shit plot. You're not allowed that one. That's yeah. a grade three. <laughs> <laughs> um so because that was a bit short I've also put in something about post-mortem photography because that was a very Victorian kind of death oh yeah work. that is that's really weird one it is weird yeah. um this is all from an article on bbc.com called taken from life the unsettling art of death photography and it was written by Bethan Bell in June 2016 um so Photographs became more affordable from about the 1880s and families were starting to have portraits taken. They're really kind of unsettling but poignant when you look at them and that's how she describes mm. it. And I do agree because they're unsettling because you know something's off yeah. when you look at it. Um, but it's poignant because you know that this is somebody who somebody loved and that's why they're taking a picture. Yeah. Um, loads of family poses there's one on this article and it's five children and the last child is propped up and has their eyes closed and all the rest of the children are alive 
Um, mm. sometimes sleeping infants and consumptive young ladies. There's one of this young woman and it looks like she's reclining and her eyes are open, but she sat with her parents. Um, and it was really sad because it said for a lot of families, this is the first time they'd ever even thought about having a photograph taken. Yeah. You know, because it was so expensive. It was to commemorate a mm. someone who passed. Um, some of them are hard to tell. Some are more obvious. Some of the creepier ones have had their eyes painted on. So their eyes are closed, but they've painted eyes on. So while they look quite realistic. On the corpse. On the eyelid. So yeah. There's something really on the... off about it, even yeah. though it looks quite realistic. Uh, some of the pictures on that article are girls posing with their mother who had passed, parents who were in mourning, and there's even one of an entire household like it must be cousins and aunties and uncles and there's about 20 of them and they're all posed around someone who's looks like they're sleeping on the floor and they're all mm. in there for a family snapshot um the advent of cameras that people could afford to buy on their own and taking like snapshots of each other in real life and having those to remember people by rather than a post-mortem photograph and better healthcare kind of stop these from happening so they're a really specific point in time when they were when yeah. they were the thing to do yeah because if you see a photo of a dead person now like it it's like oh I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. it's like yeah. it's really well you wouldn't would you you wouldn't walk into no. a funeral home and take a photo no. it's so far removed from anything that we would do it is. yeah but then it would it's just... be the only one yeah. That you had. yeah so so that's a bit sad sorry end on mm. a sad note but that's some victorian death and mourning rituals lovely thank you cynthia <laughs> you're welcome um well i'm going on to a you know an equally cheerful topic <laughs> and i am talking about animal suicide Oh, so, I know we were talking earlier about doing trigger warnings, weren't we? But yeah. we said just a blanket trigger warning for this entire podcast, really, because we're talking yes. about such strange things. But I know that animals getting hurt. I know this now. Animals getting hurt um, is too much for some people. Um, yeah. It's, you know, it's a lot for me. I love animals. I don't want to hear about them getting hurt or anything. But one of the things um, in my book, Mark of the Wicked, there's a bit of uh, implied animal violence and that that's really affected people when you read the reviews and stuff on Goodreads there's been a lot of comments about yeah about all of that and I really had no idea but when when I wrote when I did the first draft of this um Mark of the Wicked uh I had this scene with a horse where a horse um is given a sort of uh, magical thing and it sort of makes the horse sort of turn and he the he the horse runs over and over into a tree trunk until, it's, until it breaks its neck yeah and um and obviously it's devastating for for Matilda watching this happen because it's her favorite horse and and I got the idea of it um I think it must have been I think I think I read I read about this thing I'm going to tell you about in a minute but also that scene from Never Ending Story with Artax, the, the horse, where he's he's in the, um, the swamp of sadness and he's just like being overwhelmed by like just the sadness and the depression until he just kindly kind of finally gives up. And I think that's always stuck with me, that scene. Mm. But when, when we were going through the editing process, my editor said, it's too much, too much. And she was a horse lover. So she was like, yeah, oh, it's just, it's just too much people aren't going to like this so we changed it and the horse was fine <laughs> but um I just wanted to share <laughs> where 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 this all came from so I came across an article years ago I can't remember where it was it must have been on like BuzzFeed or something like that but it was about this bridge called Overton Bridge um which is in Dumbarton in Scotland and it's like this big ornate 19th century bridge um which is known locally as the dog suicide bridge oh no 
I know. So, yeah, you can imagine. So dating back to at least the 1950s or when they started recording these cases, dogs have just been on the bridge, walking along with their owner off the lead and just for some reason or other, just jumped off the side um, into like a 50 foot ravine. Oh, and, my God. Um, yeah, and since they've recorded, since they've started recording the incidents, um, there's been over 50, 50 dogs that have died, but six hundred dogs have actually jumped <gasps> and survived the fall. Oh my god! There it's must rich. be something that smells down there, or well, yeah. Okay. Um, the, and there was one apparently one dog jumped off, survived the fall, came up and jumped off again. Oh my god! But obviously. I know that is what my dog would do. I know I was going to say that's what Lowe would do. He would do that. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, people are sort of speculating as to what it is that's making, but I just thought that was so an animal being compelled to throw itself to its death. Yeah. Um, I thought that was really interesting and weird, and obviously really sad. Uh, so I am I'm kind of glad glad that my editor made me change that bit with the horse because I think it was probably pretty upsetting it was quite graphic but the so experts have sort of been talking about what it is about this bridge that's making these dogs jump off and apparently somebody said that um a lot of the dogs that have been recorded are like dogs with like a longer snout so their sense of smell is like you know super super duper and they're getting a scent of mink in the area and that's they're just it's just too much for them so it gets them into a bit of a frenzy although somebody says there's no mink in the area so they're not really sure where that's come from but they've said that it is it must be that they're picking up a scent of some kind and then the edges of this bridge are kind of tapered so it's it's easy for them to fall off uh but i don't know i mean 600 dogs yeah that's a lot that's not one or one every couple of months no, and, and then somebody else said that the bridge is haunted by a grieving widow called the White Lady of Overton. And so her presence on the bridge is sort of stirring these dogs into... Okay, it's like spooking them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I picture her, rather than being on the bridge, maybe being beneath the bridge, or well, there's, there's something down there that they can see that mm. they're... Yeah. So yeah, that just I just think that's really weird. Um, that is weird. I've never heard. Yeah, of that. but then so then I started looking up the idea of animal suicide in gen- general and whether it was a thing. Um, so the idea of it, it's quite there's been quite a lot of discussion and a lot of study on it, and it's quite quant- it's quite it's quite controversial I'm trying to say because there's not enough data and this is from Wikipedia it it says it implies a wide animal suicide the idea of animal you know an animal committing suicide implies a wide range of higher cognitive capacities that experts have been wary to ascribe to non-human animals such as a concept of self of death and future intention so there's a bit of like they're not really sure whether it's something that an animal can really yeah but then animals are so clever that like if there was something wrong with them would they rather put themselves out of their misery than yeah than carry on yeah you hear of um these poor you know caged animals or whatever who are just so sad and depressed with their life that they just you know they're bashing their head against something yeah um to kind of end it because they're not anyway I mean it's it's such a it's such a sad thing but um so yeah I mean they're 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 not really sure about it but experts they don't they they haven't decided but I mean it's like why do why do healthy whales beach themselves you know for no reason that seems really but then somebody said that the way that they travel and the way they live they're sort of if if one one whale for example is is not well or and accidentally kind of does it then the rest of them will just follow so there's some explanation oh. apparently but um it, it, it's something that people have been fascinated since victorian england you'll be surprised to hear yeah. um so uh, there was a london news article that reported a dog who appeared to be dr- trying to drown itself and and 
they just kept trying to rescue it. And apparently it says it again rushed in and at last determinedly held its head underwater until its life was extinct. Oh. Um, there was a growing number of reports that circulated um, about a duck that drowned itself, a cat that hanged itself from a branch following the death of her kittens. Oh. Um, and timing wise, the examples seem to bounce off the emerging idea that animals also had inner lives and that they should they should be spared pain and suffering. So, um, but then this, there's an expert, Barbara King, who's an anthropologist. She says the term suicide is iffy in a scientific framework because it requires us to prove that an animal's conscious, a conscious intention to die. Okay. So how can we possibly measure that really? So it's not um, a survival instinct. Yeah. It's a but, different type, it's a more, it's making the decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she does say though that um, dolphins are, are the the strongest indication that suicide does happen in the animal kingdom because they are so smart and so intelligent. Um, she says that they've been known to hold their breath until they die when faced with certain death from hunting, oh my or God. if they if they've been confined. Um, and she says dolphins are conscious breathers and they're extremely intelligent to the extent of being able to plan in complex ways. So perhaps suicide is within their realm of choice wow. to, to get out of the situation. Um, there's also somebody else, Dr. David Pino, Pino Guzman of San Francisco State University. He's written a lot about the subject and he says that they're capable of self-destructive behavior. There's also evidence that animals have rich emotional lives and experience negative things like um, PTSD, depression um, and grief. And, you know, yeah, which definitely. Is amongst people. Yeah. I think just if you have a pet, you know that, you know, if well, you've that, ever had a pet. Yeah, that, that's the other thing. Different. That's the other thing that he went on to say, um, that animals who lose animals who lose their human companions, they can they can die. It's almost like they die because they're just so devastated at the loss. That's I know. So I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's horrible, isn't it? It's so sad. Um, that episode. And, yeah. But then somebody else said that it's it's not that they're making a conscious decision to die. It's just that they're their routine and their life has just changed so suddenly that they're yeah. like, they're not responding to, to the person who's trying to feed them or trying to comfort them or whatever, because they're not used to that person because their person isn't there anymore. Oh, that's so, so sad. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, like I said, it is a, it's a really sad one, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this one, which is um, <laughs> this, I, it's, reminded me of, of what Kat was talking about earlier with her leeches and it's not quite so sad because it's about parasites so um so I got this from Wikipedia so apparently um there's certain types of parasites that will cause their hosts to engage in suicidal behavior I mean this is so sci-fi isn't it I think yeah and is it like you can get fungi that does it I think and I think it, like, there's takes there's... over ants brains and makes them do stuff yeah yeah, so um, yeah, it, it alters how their host acts. Um, so that it, it's not really suicide, but it is like kind of controlling them. Yeah. And um, that's very yeah. Stephen King. There's a Stephen yes. King like that, I'm sure. Yeah, or what? I cannot say this word. Film Anthocapephala? Yeah. Um, it's a parasitic worm anyway. So it, it, it it will direct its host to a predator so it can be eaten by the predator, which will then be its new host. And then there's another parasitic worm called the Spinocorridus tellini, which will develop in grasshoppers and crickets until it's grown, at which time it will cause its host to leap into water to its death so the worm can reproduce in water. That's crazy. Isn't it? Yeah, that's really I scary. Mean, Between leeches yeah. and parasitic worm yeah, it says yeah however this this particular worm only causes its host to drown when the host is already close to water as opposed to seeking it out over large distances so it doesn't control it doesn't like go right let's go find some water it can sense when it's near some water but you can imagine that there's been some sci-fi writers who have like read about yeah. these parasitic worms and thought right definitely yeah so yeah, it was a bit of a journey that one, animal suicide from oh. that, that dog bridge to um yeah that parasitic worms. 
sorry about that I know sorry sad one <laughs> yeah you know pictures of dead people and <laughs> oh god but that's why we're here for the yeah. weird stuff so on that note see you next week yeah see you later <laughs> browser history deleted